The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Please be seated, everyone. Today we have one oral argument this afternoon, Planned Parenthood of the Heartland, Emma Goldman Clinic and Sarah Traxler, MD, versus Kim Reynolds, XRL State of Iowa and the Board of Medicine. It looks to me like the parties are ready to begin, and it's my understanding um, Eric Wesson will be arguing for the state and Peter Eam for Planned Parenthood. Okay, Mr. Wesson, you may begin. May it please the court, my name is Eric Wesson, rising today representing Governor Kim Reynolds and the Iowa Board of Medicine. Every justice on this court has recognized that the state plays a vital role in protecting unborn life. The legislature and the governor agree, which is why, for the second time, they enacted a law protecting unborn life from the point at which a fetal heartbeat can be detected. Unfortunately, that law has been enjoined for almost nine months since shortly after its enactment under the now defunct Casey Undue Burden Test. This court should finish what it started in Planned Parenthood 2022. It should apply its precedents under the Iowa Constitution and the Due Process Clause, and it should apply rational basis review. In Planned Parenthood 2022, this court began to look at what, what the proper standard of review for laws protecting unborn life would be. Starting with Searing in 2005, this court has a long chain of cases that clearly articulates the two-step test in how to address substantive due process claims under the Iowa Constitution. The first part of that test involves two related questions, and the second part of the test applies the standard of review to the law in question. The first part of the test first asks about the nature of the right in question. If the nature of the right is a fundamental right, the court moves on to the second question. If the right is not fundamental in nature, the court applies strict scrutiny. If it is a fundamental right, the court then asks whether the challenged law directly and substantially interferes with the exercise of that right. If the answer to that question too is that it does not, rational basis applies, else strict scrutiny applies. A majority of this court held in Planned Parenthood 2022 that abortion is not a fundamental right subject to strict scrutiny. So under its longstanding substantive due process jurisprudence, this court should apply rational basis. And that makes sense. Genevieve, how would the law fare if we would continue to apply the undue burden standard? Burden standard involves a per se rule prohibiting any restriction on abortion uh, before viability. This law uh, restricts access to abortion when a fetal heartbeat is detected, which is before viability. Under the Casey undue burden test, this law would fail. That said, there are many critiques of the Casey undue burden test, and the best place to look for those critiques are with the Supreme Court that, as Chief Justice Roberts acknowledged, created the test as if from thin air. That test largely involves two separate parts. First is the standard applied to pre-viability abortion restrictions. That part of the test is a per se rule against any restriction on, vi on abortions before viability. The second part of the test, which is equally problematic in its own way, applies an undue burden test, which Justice Scalia acknowledged in his Casey dissent is inherently standardless and asks for judges to substitute their own judgment for that of the duly enacted legislature and governors of the states. What do we do? <clears throat> uh, PPH 2022 overruled the strict scrutiny standard. Uh, and as I read it, it said there was no fundamental right. But in PPH 2018, a majority of the court also criticized and rejected the undue burden standard. Is that criticism and rejection of the undue burden standard 
still controlling law, um, since it was agreed to by a majority of the court at that time, that it was just an unworkable standard. The undue burden standard uh, was discarded in PPH 2018 by a majority of the court. And then PPH 2018's central holding applying strict scrutiny after finding a fundamental right was discarded in 2022. That being said, this court was absolutely descriptively accurate in 2022 when a plurality of the court recognized that at the time the opinion issued, Casey applied for now. Fortunately, now, then, is not now, now. And it's important to go back to how this court has addressed its fundamental rights jurisprudence because it makes sense when a right is fundamental, when it is deeply rooted in the concepts of ordered liberty and in our history to apply strict scrutiny. But this court has never before recognized a quasi-fundamental or a fundamental-ish right. It's a binary choice, which is why this court's cases in Searing, in McQuiston, in Hensler, frequently look to see whether there is a direct and substantial interference with a fundamental. Really, is it really a binary choice? Um, I mean, the point that we made is, if it's a substantial and material interference, then you apply strict scrutiny. If it's something less than a substantial interference, then it's okay. Uh, and then there are other rights that are that you can do whatever you want because they're not rights at all. So it seems to me maybe there's three choices. Your Honor, looking closely at the cases highlighted in Planned Parenthood 2022 is illustrative of this court's approach in the substantive due process jurisprudence. Looking at McQuiston, the question was whether one, a fundamental right was implicated, and then whether there was a substantial and direct interference with the right. If the answer to those questions was yes, then strict scrutiny was going to apply. But if not, it was rational basis. At no point and in no case that I was able to find was a single instance under substantive due process of any type of intermediate scrutiny used by this court. The choice ultimately comes down to one of either strict scrutiny protecting fundamental rights or if a fundamental right is implicated. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, it seems to me it's two approaches to the same issue. Uh, and I think I said that before, and I've been criticized by some of the briefing on your side, but you can, one approach is to say that it's a substantial and direct interference, and another approach is, in, in, in which case, we're going to apply strict scrutiny, which means that the law is not going to go forward. And if it's not a substantial and direct interference, then you don't apply uh, strict scrutiny, you apply rational basis, which means automatically pretty much the law is upheld. And so substantial and direct interference, that determination is kind of an intermediate scrutiny, isn't it? Might be helpful in looking at exactly how this test has worked, because in that case, the court found that there was a fundamental right implicated, but because that fundamental right was not directly and substantially interfered with, the court applied rational basis review. There are the two steps in the test, and the direct and substantial interference is not some additional tier of scrutiny. It determines whether or not strict scrutiny applies. And so under McQuiston and under Searing, which was the first articulation of this two-step test in such a clear way, which has since been affirmed again and again by majorities of this court, there's never been an intermediate scrutiny actually applied at that second step of the test. At the second step, this court has always either applied strict scrutiny or rational basis. And that's the reason why in Planned Parenthood 2022, when the state had not yet asked for rational basis to apply, but this court began the substantive due process analysis at the first part of the test. It now needs to finish the analysis, explain that because there is not a fundamental right subject to strict scrutiny, that rational basis applies, just like in Hensler, just like in McQuistian, just like in Searing, and then under rational basis, this law should survive. Basis review, uh, could the state uh, um, outlaw abortion altogether instead of allowing a six week window? The most helpful point on that is actually from then Justice Rehnquist's dissent in Roe v. Wade itself, where he acknowledged that if the state of Texas had tried to ban 
abortion altogether without protection for the life of the mother, that that would not survive rational basis review. And I think it's equally important as both sides bring passion to the important issues in this case to look at one example that is frequently trotted out in the parade of horribles that would happen if laws like this were allowed to succeed. One of those examples is the issue of an ectopic pregnancy. To the state's knowledge, ectopic pregnancies are never viable and will always or almost always lead to the death or substantial injury of the mother. Under the law enacted here in Iowa, there is no circumstance in which an ectopic pregnancy would not be able to be treated as healthcare for the would-be mother. And that is what's important. And that is why this law should survive rational basis review. Because the legislature embraced the important values of respecting unborn life, of respecting the health and well-being of mothers, of respecting the integrity of the medical profession, and in their- Could the legislature eliminate the exceptions for rape and incest? Some states, having looked at laws that eliminate the exceptions for rape and incest, have found those to survive rational basis review. That's not the law here today. And both uh, rape and incest are protected under Iowa Code Section 146E. In the view of the state, what right does a woman have to control her own health care decisions, including terminating a pre pregnancy? Any right? Enumerated rights protected by the substantive due process jurisprudence under Iowa's Constitution are all important, but they're not all fundamental. And rational basis review is not a carte blanche for the state to enact laws that have no reasonable relationship to the values that they're trying to protect. But here, as this, state hits, as this court has repeatedly recognized, there is an important value at stake. There are many important values at stake. In Planned Parenthood 2021, this court explained first that statutes are entitled to the presumption of constitutionality. And continuing, this court said that in order to find a law facially invalid or enforcement of a law to be facially invalid, it must meet a standard akin to beyond a reasonable doubt. Here, the legislature came together at this court's invitation after the decisions in Planned Parenthood 2023 and enacted a law intending to protect unborn life, to protect the health and well being of mothers, to protect the medical profession, to prevent invidious discrimination that sometimes occurs in the abortion context. All of those have been enacted into law in Iowa Code Section 146E, and that law should be allowed to go into effect. On um, the dissent by Rehnquist that had to do with. Uh, a rational basis would not be satisfied if there were no exceptions, just plain no abortion ever. Is that correct? Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about the fetal heartbeat exceptions in Iowa's statute. Um, rape, if it's reported within 45 days, and incest, if within 140 days. I don't understand the distinction between the two, why one is 45 days and one's 140. But what evidence is that based on that that's even, isn't that kind of more or less shutting the door on all rapes and incest? Because I think anyone who's prosecuted or been a part of that world knows that those numbers are very unrealistic for actually being reported. It's important to recognize who those must be reported to. So if one wants to receive an abortion under the rape or incest exception, one of the people that the woman can tell and report that to is the doctor providing the abortion. It is not unreasonable to ask that if a woman wants a rape or incest exception to the law generally prohibiting abortion, that she tell her doctor that she was a victim of rape or incest in order to get that exclusion to the general rule. It doesn't require reporting to law enforcement or to some outside factor, but if the woman in question seeks an abortion in that time frame, uh, that's a necessary part of getting even use the word rape, and that would be a, a woman going to, for example, the public or private health agency. Um, typically, in, in, if, without any restrictions, she could get an abortion without even explaining the details. She wouldn't have to say it was rape, um, but uh, you're assuming she's going to say, I was raped. Is that correct? In order to receive an exception to the general prohibition on abortion after a heartbeat is detected, a woman would have to explain which exception she would fall into. Uh, one of those would be rape, another would be incest, uh, 
and presumably the health or life of the mother exception would more likely be a combination of the woman having a conversation with her doctor about the health issues that arise. Incest, Do you have, can you shed any light on why there's 45 days versus 140 days? Under the rational basis review, the law has to have a reasonable relation to the important state interest being considered. Here, the state interest is protecting unborn life, protecting the health and well-being of the mother. The various discussions and conversations in the legislature coming to exactly where to draw a line at a certain number of days should survive rational basis review, even if those days are different. But as you stated in Rehnquist's opinion, it could, if, if, these, if these provisions hadn't been in there at all, that's the same as saying no exceptions. But putting them in with hardly any opportunity for those exceptions to actually be met, doesn't that matter? The most important exception and the one without which the law would likely suffer is the life of the mother exception. The rape and incest exceptions also are important and that is why the legislature included them. But looking at specifically how many days go to one or the other risks having the court substitute its policy preferences for the policy preferences of the legislature. The district court decided its um, injunction based on due process. What do we do if we were to agree with you and we send it back, what do we do um, with the other challenges under the Equal Protection Clause and, and Alienable Rights Clause? The injunction below is entered on substantive due process and it, the court should, in this case, reverse and render for the state. There are two reasons for the Equal Protection Clause and Inalienable Rights Clause. A majority of this court found in Planned Parenthood 2022 that the Equal Protection Clause does not protect the right to an abortion. A majority of the court found that. There's no reason no one is briefed uh, readdressing that today. As for inalienable rights, this court a couple years ago in Garrison against New Fashioned Pork explained that any law challenged under the Inalienable Rights Clause is subject to rational basis review. But even before Garrison, uh, under the tests in Gaki and the tests preceding that, social and economic laws were also subject to rational basis review. So whether it's the Equal Protection Clause, the Inalienable Rights Clause, the Substantive Due Process right under the Due Process Clause, rational basis is the standard of review that applies. Inalienable Rights Clause, I've said before, I think, in Garrison that I view those both article, uh, excuse me, Article 1, Section 1 and Section 2 because they're essentially paraphrases of language in the Declaration of Independence. I think they come originally from the Virginia Declaration of the Rights of something. And that I view those as outlines of the how gov a just government should be structured rather than rules governing the government itself. However, since I wrote that, uh, the, the legislature and the people of Iowa have now put in the middle, sandwiched in the middle of those two, a section 1A that clearly seems to me designed to actually affirmatively recognize some rights and do some actual work. Does that tell us that now the people of Iowa have a different view of section one and section two? since they've put something right in the middle of it that has, uh, seems to be uh, uh, of very significant importance to the people of this state. To bear arms is a very important right to the people of the state. I'm not aware of a constitutional theory that takes the numbering of amendments into account in determining their importance. For example, looking at the US Bill of Rights, the initial two amendments that were proposed were never enacted. Well. One ended up being enacted as the 26th Amendment significantly later, but just because the amendment there is 1A, I, there's no reason and no one has briefed that that should affect the analysis of either the uh, Section 1 or Section 2 of the Iowa Constitution. But perhaps most importantly, there is a long tradition of how social and economic laws that are challenged under the Inalienable Rights Clause have been treated. And that, make that decision first since it hasn't? Your Honor, that would be perfectly appropriate and to the extent that the district court thought it was bound to apply the pluralities holding that Casey applied for now in Planned Parenthood 2022, I'm sure the district court would agree that it is bound to apply rational basis review under Garrison. Uh, given that, 
heard that Article One, Section One was amended in 1998. Does that have any any bearing on our analysis? No, Your Honor. To the extent that it was amended in 1998, the without having done a deep dive because that issue has not been uh, briefed or presented, there is no additional level of heightened scrutiny in any social or economic law. And the Garrison case and the Gacky case and many of the cases that this court has issued since 1998 have held that rational basis is the only appropriate standard of review for challenges brought under that section. So unless this court wishes to revisit a long line of precedent preceding 1998 and postdating 1998, there would be no reason to have rational basis apply now or anything other than rational basis apply now. The third party standing or derivative standing uh, argument. Yes, Your Honor, although I see I'm out of time, uh, may I continue? In Planned Parenthood 2021, this court recognized that uh, there is no freestanding right to provide an abortion. And so in that case, it found that Planned Parenthood could assert a derivative right on behalf of the women who would be patients in their clinic. Our understanding of third party standing is that there are severe deficiencies in extending that standing to the context here. For example, in the, my friend on the other side's complaint, uh, in the substantive due process clause uh, claim at the end, they explicitly say they're bringing that on behalf of their patients. As the court, Supreme Court and Dobbs recognized, there are conflicts of interest between abortion providers and women that would normally impede the applicability of the third party doctrine to those contexts. While there are some cases that have assumed without deciding that third party standing can extend to abortion providers, one thing that the Dobbs majority suggested is that various distortions in the law that sprung from the unique jurisprudence of abortion should no longer be considered. And while the Supreme Court has not yet addressed third party standing in the abortion context, this court has an opportunity to clarify its own case law and to explain that third party standing is not appropriate for abortionists and that women should be able to assert their own rights in court and there is nothing impeding their ability to do so. Thank you. Mr. Eam. Madam Chief, Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Peter Eam on behalf of Petitioner Appellee's Planned Parenthood of the Heartland and Dr. Sarah Traxler, but today I'll be arguing on behalf of all appellees. This is the state's appeal of a temporary injunction, which this court reviews for abuse of discretion. PPH 2022, which is the controlling precedent, clearly stated that undue burden, quote, remains the governing standard, unquote. The district court got it right by applying that standard and certainly did not abuse its discretion by committing legal error. Two years ago, a plurality of this court stated that autonomy and dominion over one's own body go to the very heart of what it means to be free. That's what's at stake in this case. It's Iowans' ability to make decisions, private and personal medical decisions, to exercise bodily autonomy, and to decide when and whether to have children. Rational basis is simply inconsistent with the importance of these rights, and undue burden is the correct standard. And so this court should affirm, because the district court correctly applied undue burden and did not abuse its discretion in doing so rights have we recognized and applied an intermediate level of scrutiny that wasn't a fundamental right? So I want to start with the language of the plurality opinion from 2022, where a plurality of this court stated that all we hold today is that there is no fundamental right to abortion or that the Iowa Constitution doesn't provide a fundamental right to abortion subject to strict scrutiny or necessitating a strict scrutiny standard of review. As the district court held, this is a narrow opinion and those words mean something. That is the controlling precedent in this court right now. And so it didn't say that it automatically goes to rational basis. And if the plurality had believed that there was no such thing as an intermediate level of scrutiny, then it would not have lowered the standard 
to undue burden. Undue burden is actually the appropriate standard. Is outside of the abortion context, in what other case have we applied an intermediate level of scrutiny to something that was not recognized as a fundamental right? You cite two cases in your brief. The first one was Democratic Senatorial Campaign versus Pate, which relied on Burdick, which involved a fundamental right of voting, and we applied an intermediate level of scrutiny. And then you rely on State versus Musser, uh, which was a free speech case. And by necessity, free speech is a fundamental right because it's incorporated in the 14th Amendment. So I'm asking for the authority of a case where we've applied intermediate scrutiny when there isn't a fundamental right recognized. Your Honor, first, I would disagree that there is no fundamental right. There is no fundamental right ne necessitating a strict scrutiny standard of review, but autonomy and dominion over one's own body, that runs through the Iowa Constitution that is fundamental. And although this court has not explicitly uh, applied intermediate scrutiny, in a substantive due process context, I want to pick up on Justice Mansfield's line of questioning to counsel for the state. In McQuiston, in searing in that line of cases, there is this idea that in cases that involve familial rights, like the right to procreate, the right to make parental decisions, those kinds of cases, there are important government interests on the other side. And so strict scrutiny. But in McQuiston, and the other cases you've cited, we have a long history of cases going back to the early 1900s that say custody, care, and control of a minor is a fundamental right. And that's Pierce, that's Meyer versus Nebraska. So I'm asking you, what is the case where we have applied an intermediate level of scrutiny where there is no fundamental right that has been recognized? And I understand you disagree about whether or not PPH 2022 resolve that question of whether there's a fundamental right. I just want to know of the case outside of the abortion context where we've applied the intermediate level of scrutiny. In the substantive due process context, there is not. This court has applied intermediate scrutiny in the context of voting, in the context of free speech, in the context of equal protection. Varnum itself was an intermediate scrutiny case. And the reason that we have intermediate scrutiny in this case, as this court has uh, explained, again, again, the reason for undue burden, is because on the one hand, you have autonomy and dominion over one's own body, and also because, as the PPH 2022 plurality stated, parenthood is a life-altering obligation that falls unevenly on women in our society. So because of those rights, that are recognized under the Constitution. That's why rational basis isn't appropriate. But then on the other side. Didn't we reject that argument in PPH 2022? I'm sorry, the equal protection argument? So uh, the court did reject equal protection as uh, requiring strict scrutiny in the abortion context, and we're not questioning that holding. Uh, but the equality of women in our society doesn't just find its home in Article One, Section 6. It's also implicated by Article One, Section 1. And that goes to Justice Oxley's question earlier. So we did bring a claim, and we urged it at the district court uh, about the inalienable rights clause, which provides that all men and women are by nature free and equal. And it also guarantees, including expressly to women, the right to enjoy and defend liberty and the right to pursue and obtain safety. And that's really what this is about. Point, are you asking us to overrule Garrison in which we said that Article One, Section One is subject to rational basis? I'm not asking for that. This court has not spoken to, going to your question earlier, Justice McDermott, the uh, 1998 amendment of the Iowa Constitution by the Iowa voters, in which they added the words and women to Article One, Section One, and that also has to mean something. In 1990... Yes, Mr. M, is in 1992, a different version of that amendment went before voters and that would have, that said neither the state nor any of its political subdivisions shall on the basis of gender deny or restrict the equality of rights under the law. That one went down to defeat. So then in 1998, this other version, the one that, that simply added and women to Article One, 
section one went before the voters, and that's the one that passed. So what do we make of the earlier denial, the earlier voting down of the 1992 version? say first that the 1992 electorate is different than the 1998 electorate, and so we have to consider what the electorate did. Uh, I would also say, though, that um that in 1998, by that point, um, I believe Casey was decided in 93, so Casey was undeniably the law of the land, and abortion rights were protected. And so uh, they, it wouldn't necessarily mean that the, um, that the amendment protected anything extra that didn't already find any protection. It could have just enshrined the rights of women in place at the time. But also, all, these claims haven't been passed on by the district court. Uh, we are here on an appeal where uh, the district court ruled within five days of when we first, first filed the case, and although we did urge Article 1, Section 1 below, the district court didn't rule on it. Our uh, arguments are in the record at, at uh, 133 to 137, and they are sufficient for this court to uh, use as an alternate ground to affirm. However, this court should remand for, for these important arguments to be developed below in the first instance. I think that would provide the district court an ample opportunity. In PPH 2022, uh, this court evinced a clear intent for the district court to rule on these issues in the first instance, be and, and I think that's, that the undue burden standard is unworkable, and I think your position is that you need to be able to develop that record. What kind of evidence would you put in the record addressing the unworkability of that standard? Two responses, Your Honor. First, uh, the state does argue that the undue burden standard is unworkable, but then it admits that it knows exactly how the standard would work in this case. And so the question of workability isn't squarely before the court, but I understand that the court would want to consider it. And so my second response is that we could put in the record evidence, for example, uh, relating to uh, other burdens. Uh, we have a lot of, of evidence that talks about harm, uh, but the National Infertility Association's amicus brief, for example, talks about the, the uh, implications of this ban on people who are seeking to grow their families via in vitro fertilization. And certainly, if this ban would have an impact on that, we could put in evidence about the burdens and about workability in that context. We could also uh, put in factual evidence about the Board of Medicine rules. So at the time, that the district court decided the temporary injunction. The Board of Medicine had not obviously promulgated any rules um, explaining how the, the statute would be implemented. Those have just been adopted. Obviously, they can't be enforced. But Excuse me. Would we have to overrule the part of PPH 2018 where a majority of the court rejected the undue burden standard in saying, quote, it fails to offer an objective standard by which the effect should be judged it offers no real guidance and engenders no expectation among the citizens, citizenry that governmental regulation of abortion will be objective, even-handed, or well-reasoned. And then it goes on and on explaining why, as a legal proposition, undue burden uh, doesn't work. And that's a majority holding of that court. So do we need to overrule that part of PPH 2018? that that majority holding survived PPH 2022. PPH 2022 repealed PPH 2018 um, and said that for now undue burden is the standard. And so it repealed that portion of PPH 2018. As for unworkability, I'll say this. The uh, undue burden standard is a legal standard. It is not a bright line rule. And as with any other legal standard, there are borderline cases where judges of good conscience can disagree. And that is how our common law is developed. That kind of thing happens all the time in federal court, in other state courts. But if this court were to embrace the undue burden standard in Iowa, it could chart its own path and say what the standard governing abortion restrictions will be in Iowa. It's not required to stick to federal court precedent, but it can take guidance from 30 years of precedent. And that's in line with the role of this court in saying what the Iowa Constitution means, is that it is emphatically this court's role and duty to say that how the Iowa Constitution protects individual rights, how it protects bodily autonomy, how it protects Iowans' rights to exercise dominion over their own bodies similar question that I asked the other side. If we were to apply rational basis, how would this law fare? 
Rational basis in Iowa is not a toothless standard, as this court has said in Racy. And I think that the state's concession that there are some abortion bans that do not pass rational basis really highlights that if this court were to consider applying rational basis, it should remand to the district court to apply that standard in the first instance. Because, uh, because there is really no reason why there should be a 45-day limit, as, as Madam Chief Justice, you pointed out, uh, for reporting rape. That does not provide ample opportunity for sexual assault victims to come forward. Uh, and there are studies that show that reporting is extremely, extremely difficult. And I, I'm not sure that that would satisfy rational basis. What question on that, on that, uh, the rape and then the incest. On the incest one, I was curious, I'm not sure maybe it's in the record, maybe not, I doubt it is. But um, the requirement is for reporting to law enforcement or medical person doesn't say you can, a young girl could tell her mom or, or someone, um, who, is that, am I correct? It's professionals. And we certainly could develop further facts on that if, if this were remanded to the district court. If we were to uh, develop a new Iowa standard for evaluating uh, abortion laws, should we consider the history of Iowa uh, going back to the founding and the way that the uh, abortion has been regulated in the past, is that important? It does have bearing, of course, on constitutional interpretation, but I think it also bears noting that in the 19th century, women were not equal citizens in Iowa. And this court does not use history as a trump card. It didn't do so in Varnum. And it, in fact, it, it has a long history actually going back as, as far, at, even further than the history of the state, all the way back to In re Ralph, uh, where this court has protected individual rights much broader than the federal constitution. Also on the historical point, I think that's why the 1998 argument is, is important. And I think we can develop further, you know, what the meaning of the 1992 amendment that was rejected versus the 1998 amendment. What sort of evidence would you do to um, flesh out what it meant when uh, in 1998, eight, uh, the voters of Iowa added and women to the inalienable rights clause? Some, um, some arguments, fairly brief in the record at 133 to 137 about it, but it could include everything from press reports, it could include um, r statements by the sponsors of the amendment, and, and all kinds of other evidence that we could marshal below uh, to, to talk about. The amendment was purely stylistic. Uh, would you disagree with that? I think that it has to mean something when the Iowa voters uh, pass an amendment and change the words of the Constitution, particularly the first section of the Constitution that talks about inalienable rights. Well, they did call it the Equal Rights Amendment when they put it before the voters, so I hope they weren't trying to mislead the voters into voting for something that's just stylistic. That's right, Your Honor. And I think that uh, it's important to uh, to acknowledge the unequal burden that this would have on women. Uh, going back to the point about PPH 2022, um, PPH 2022 rejected the Equal Protection Clause analysis because uh, it held that uh, women were not similarly situated to men in the context of pregnancy. Uh, but the Inalienable Rights Clause does not just guarantee liberty and safety to women when they're similarly situated to men. It guarantees those rights full stop. And those are arguments that we do plan to develop below. Uh, and, and so I think that it's really critical to, to recognize that autonomy and dominion don't just find their home in the Substantive Due Process Clause. They run through the Iowa Constitution article. We'll rule Garrison to do that, which we did apply rational basis review to a um, farm liability or nuisance immunity provision. And I think that's because of this 1998 amendment, because the, the general rule might be that rational basis applies uh, for inalienable rights protected by Article One, Section One in general, but because of the addition of and women. And, and it's also ultimately up to this court, if this court wants to carve out an exception to garrison because of the unique circumstances of abortion restrictions and because of what it looks like to weigh uh, the, the rights and interests at stake. Broadly worded clause. I mean, I think I pointed out on garrison, it includes the right to obtain happiness. I mean, everybody in this room could sue for that. Right? 
to misquote your, your opinion, we're not suing for specific performance on that. We are, um, we're simply saying that these words have to mean something. This court has also held that it's not just a gleaming generality. On that point, what words in Article One, Section 1 do you point to as, as establishing this right? Article One, Section 1 provides all men and women are by nature free and equal. It also provides that they have certain inalienable rights, among which are those of enjoying and defending liberty and pursuing and obtaining safety. All of those are implicated by Article One, Section 1. And if this court also wants to uh, conclude that a combination of the rights in that section or a combination of rights in that section and elsewhere in the Iowa Constitution are protective of abortion, then it can choose to do so, and it certainly wouldn't be the first court to do so. In PPH 2022, the court referred to Minnesota and referred to how the Minnesota Supreme Court had found a right to abortion in a combination of clauses. And that's also an argument that we could develop below on remand. But we... Something you said earlier, and you had mentioned because of the status of women's right to vote at the time of the founding, maybe some of that historical evidence uh, or case law should be discounted. Uh, I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, but something to that effect. I guess what is the legal import of that? Because my conclusion from that would be that we should defer then to the current democratic majority, which includes women. And this law was signed into law by a woman. The attorney general is a woman, she's defending the law. So I guess I wanna understand fully what the legal consequence of that argument you're making is, because I'm not sure why that leads to the court then interpreting the Constitution over the rights of people who are currently voting. That historical argument alone, it is one of several arguments that I, I think that we could make. Uh, but I, I think uh, there's another kind of question, I think, within your question about the democratic interests, and I do want to talk about that. So. It is emphatically the role of this court to say what the Constitution means. This court has said that the Constitution is a break that in invalidates contrary laws, and it is a vital check on government encroachment on individual rights. And so just because the legislature has passed the law does not make it constitutional. And it's not like there is no um, recourse to the democratic process. The legislature knows how to amend the Constitution, and I believe it still can do so. But what deference should we give the legislature, this elected body just last summer that came up with this? Who does represent people across the state, every geographical area, every gender, everyone above 18? What deference, what deference should we give them? Almost out of time, may I answer the question? The level of deference to the legislature is certainly most important, I think, in issues of policy. But when it comes to individual rights, there is no political question doctrine. There is no doctrine that says that this court should defer to the legislature if the legislature passes a law that rides roughshod over the right of Iowans to exercise bodily autonomy. Pre-viability uh, pre abortion has been legal in Iowa for the last 50 years. All we ask is that this court leave that status quo in place pending a final judgment at the district court. For all of these reasons, we ask this court to affirm. Ultimately, this case comes down to what my friend on the other side said in his response, which is that they're seeking a carve out to treat abortion rights differently than other rights. What this court's majority said in Planned Parenthood 2022 at page 740 is that textually, there is no basis for a fundamental right to an abortion. Out, you know, uh, the, um, in the code of 1851, so the code that was in effect when our, the, our Constitution was adopted, and in the code of 1860, which was the code that was the, the next code to be enacted right after that Constitution was, there was it was a crime to cohabit. Um, could today the legislature enact a law 
uh, un and would be constitutional, making it a crime to cohabit with the person of the opposite sex who's not married. Your Honor, it's tough to judge any hypothetical law. The answer to that question likely. That's why they pay you and Mr. M the big bucks to be here. The answer to that question is likely not unless there was some rational basis undergirding that law. That being said, this is not like that situation because here we have important values on all sides and perhaps the opinion that might be most helpful to this court in looking at how to weigh those incommensurate values is Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence in the Dobbs opinion. Like this court in 2022, he recognized that there are important values on both sides of this issue. But what he said is that like in the Iowa Constitution, in the federal Constitution, there is no right to be found for abortion. And so what my friends on the other side say, that the right might be hiding here, it might be hiding there in some combination of clauses, is simply not what this court historically has done. Before this court is a straightforward question when it comes to whether the substantive due process right provides additional heightened scrutiny for the right to an abortion. This court, applying its substantive due process precedence, said that it is not a fundamental right it said so twice at page 740, based on the text and based on the history. Given that, every other case suggests that the proper standard of review is rational basis. And when it comes... Would agree with you on that point. Is that something that we can decide as applies to this particular statute, or do we need to send it back and let the district court apply that standard since it has not had a chance to? Your Honor, this court could do either. I will note that every single state Supreme Court to apply the rational basis standard of review to a fetal heartbeat statute has found that it survived, including many state Supreme Courts that in the Casey era had heightened protections for abortion under their own uh, constitutions. Now, many of, that, many of those states had that level of heightened scrutiny in the privacy clauses or somewhere in the Constitution other than the due process clause. As this court recognized, the 2018 decision finding heightened scrutiny for abortion under the Due Process Clause stood alone. And this court decided in 2022 that it would no longer stand alone. There's no reason to stand alone today and allow for a fetal heartbeat statute that protects important rights, important interests that this, state, that this court has repeatedly recognized held by the state and the responsibility that the legislature and the governor have stepped up to enforce the right of life, the important value of health and well-being of mothers, the integrity of the medical profession. Each of those can be found in Iowa Code Section 146E. To think that there is not even a rational basis for a law protecting unborn life would set this court apart. But that being said, if this court applies the standard of rational basis review and remands to the district court, the state would happily contend that this law survives rational basis review there. Applying to a couple of the other notes my friends made for you on, there's been some discussion about specific exceptions. And as I understand it, this is really kind of a challenge to the law as a whole. If we were to remand this case for further development, fact finding, et cetera, could those provisions be challenged individually versus the law as a whole? So for example, if there was some contention that the reporting period wasn't sufficiently long, that the overall framework of the statute could survive, but there could be more specific statutory challenges. Nothing would stop someone from bringing that type of challenge. And part of the reason why facial invalidation is so disfavored is because often there are lawful applications of a challenged law, even if a court were to later find that some parts of that law uh, do not work. But it's also important uh, to go back to one of your earlier questions, Justice McDonald. A majority of the court in 2018 said that the undue burden test doesn't apply. And in 2022, this court said it reversed the holding of 2018, which is that there was no fundamental right subject to strict scrutiny. When it comes to the adoption of a plurality view that Casey applied for now, 
The state's reading is that that was an acknowledgment of the state of the federal law setting a floor. Now, this court is not bound to determine uh, whether an individual right under the Iowa Constitution is at the same level more or less protective. Well, if it was more protective, we would need to say so, or less protective than a federal right. But in 2022, it's not clear what the effect of Casey is. And Justice Oxley, to go back to your question about remand, to the extent that this court only rules on the substantive due process question, uh, which it should, and it should find that rational basis applies, on remand, the district court will be bound by the garrison test, and it will be bound by the majority holding in PPH 2022 that equal protection applies rational basis. So to the extent that the district court wants to determine whether the law survives rational basis, it will be able to do so under each of the three provisions. Parenthood should get an opportunity to argue that that standard should be changed, shouldn't they? If Planned Parenthood on remand wants to argue that this court should reverse its, its majority holdings in the equal protection context or in the inalienable rights context, uh, it may do so, assuming that this court does not uh, render for the state. That being said, what is most important after years of litigation, uh, trying to determine the standard of review, that this court returns to its own analysis and its own test under the Iowa Due Process Clause, that it applies the standard that was laid out in Searing, it asks the questions about whether a fundamental right is directly and substantially interfered with by the challenge law, and it answers that question as it began to answer in 2022, no. Because if this court explains and holds that rational basis is the proper standard of review, the state is confident that this law, which is duly enacted by the legislature and is entitled to the presumption of constitutionality, will survive that review. And that the only issue before us is the substantive due process question. And I understand your point that Garrison, you believe Garrison and the majority holding on the Equal Protection Clause would bind the district court but we don't necessarily need to opine on that. You can make that argument to the district court and Planned Parenthood could argue whatever distinctions, uh, textual arguments that they think are relevant at that point in time that might distinguish Garrison or, or am I wrong in what you're saying? Your Honor, that's correct. They'll have the opportunity to do so. That being said, Garrison was unequivocal. It said that the only standard of review available under the inalienable rights clause is rational basis. The district court will be bound by that holding. Planned Parenthood can present arguments that it believes that this court got that wrong, but to the extent the district court thought it was bound by the plurality decision explaining that Casey applied for now, it is likely the district court will also find itself bound by Garrison, by Gacky, and by the other inalienable rights clause cases. That being said, uh, if this court wants to reach the question of, rational ba of whether rational basis applies to abortion, which as this court said in 2022, was not a fundamental right subject to strict scrutiny, the state will happily defend the law on the merits below as well on each of the three constitutional sections that Planned Parenthood has decided to challenge. Your Honor, it is also important to recognize that when the challenge to this law is brought under, or if, the, if my friends on the other side decide to argue that the addition of and women to the 1998 was purely hortatory, I do not want to imply that that was merely stylistic. It is important for representational purposes and for equality purposes to have men and women represented in the Constitution. Thank you all. It is hereby submitted and court is adjourned for the afternoon.